Okay. Hi, Chris. How are you? Uh, it's so good to have you here today. How are things going today? Things are going well, and uh, thank you for having me here. I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Um, it's my great pleasure, and um, let's start off like, like this. I've been a fan of your Twitter account for, uh, for a long time, and I have noticed that you have a particular fascination. I know, I know this is a German pronunciation. I hope I'm saying it correctly, but with Schelling. Is, is yes. that how you say it? That's how you say it, exactly. Okay, yep. Friedrich Schelling, as far as I know. And, um, and so I've learned a lot about him um, and uh, his thinking through you. But I wanted to just open up and, and ask, and I have a bunch of questions to ask you about his philosophy and, and people like him, but why him? Why are, you, why are you so attracted to his philosophy? What is it that, that, that draws you to it? That's a really good question. Um, so this, this is a kind of long question, but um, when I started my undergraduate, when I started my early learnings in, in university, I was already drawn to this movement. So I was drawn to thinkers like uh, Immanuel Kant. Um, he was born in 1724 and died in 1802, or 1804, sorry, um, and Hegel. Um, but I'd never heard of, I'd never heard of Schelling. I didn't hear of Schelling until um, my PhD year, my first year, actually. My mentor, who was, um, who was, is my supervisor, was su my supervisor for my dissertation. And I read um, his Freedom Essay. So in German, it's pronounced Freiheitsschrift. Um, and I was captivated by this text. It, it drew me in completely. And at the same time, there was so many puzzling questions about it. There was just so much unique um, philosophical debates to the text um, and so much I needed to learn. And uh, I had to study this text multiple times. I mean, I'm not sure how many times I've read it, but I've had to go over it with a a fine tooth comb multiple times. Um, and after that, um, I read about his biography and he had a kind of tragic life. Um, and it just kind of hit, it hit me that he was, he seems like such a, a, a normal individual, uh, such a brilliant thinker as well. And so different from the rest of the tradition. Um, I hope that, that kind of sums him yeah. up in a, in a you know, I, I, you can't. I don't know much about his life, but I will say that comparing his like before and after pictures, like by the end of his life, he looks very worn, uh, like very world weary. You know, I don't know if you can tell that much from uh, someone's image, but um, he he looks like he's been through the ringer. Um, and and I guess I should, I'd like to learn about that, but I I wanted to ask you something specific about his philosophy. And this is, you know, this is for the benefit of the audience, some of which will, some people will understand what these terms mean and others won't. And so let's try to, um, to spell it out to the best of our ability. The, the distinction between what's known as idealism, um, which Schelling uh, subscribed to, and, and, uh, and the philosophy that opposes that, which is known as realism. In, in just a couple of paragraphs, would you be able to explain what those terms mean? Of course. So, um, Schelling is, is obviously writing, when we think of the word idealism, a lot of it gets mis misconstrued with the 16th and 17th century Enlightenment philosophy of rationalism, where philosophy is drawn, or philosophy or all absolute knowledge is, you know, kind of governed by reason. But in regards to idealism, idealism is the idealism that Schelling is speaking about in particular is the idealism that Kant, um, Immanuel Kant, um, writes about. So it's, it's, it's this. Imagine the world in front of us conforming or, or being drawn to our capacities, to our understanding. So we have a kind of interior understanding of the world. It's grasped through our faculties. Um, that would be the best understanding of idealism. So, so we can understand the world, we can grasp it and its essence through a kind of ideal component. So conceptually speaking, 
Mm-hmm. And realism, I would say, is the belief that there is a world outside. Um, there's a world outside of our head. There's a world outside of our understanding. It's there. Um, and in the tradition of philosophy, it's usually, um, well, in analytic philosophy, it's usually spoken of as, as you know, a space that contains furniture. And so Schelling kind of um, plays on these two, these two specific, um, you know, disciplines. You know, he'll say later on that idealism um, is the soul of philosophy and realism is its body and only only the two together can can um, form a, a living whole so it's funny you should say that that's actually the first thing that I wrote down <laughs> that I wanted to ask you about it so you're you're exactly on track but you know it, in considering that point it seems to me like that those are like the um, the antecedents of the modern dichotomy between what I would call physicalism, you know, and and whatever doctrine we would want to call it, metaphysicalism or uh, trans- transcendentalism or something, the idea that there's something beyond just the physical. So when he describes, you know, this dichotomy between the, the body and soul, you know, in these two kinds of philosophies, does he mean that literally, you know, and, and I know that there was a certain amount of effort that he put into sort of synthesizing these these two things, but this is a very old idea, body, soul, physical, non-physical. Um, is that what he's getting at? Or is he just saying that, you know, um, these are two kinds of w- ways of thinking about the world? No, um, I, I think that he's working through, as you said, these are very old ideas. He's working through that complex tradition and he's essentially saying, um, very profoundly in a sense, that one-sided idealism uh, misses something, and one-sided realism also misses something. So I'll give you an example. You brought up physicalism. So the problem with, with just being a physicalist is that we, we start to see the world in physical terms, uh, in, all, in material terms, and we tend to reduce everything down to materiality. I'm thinking of uh, someone like the Churchlands that they reduce all stimulus down to, you know, biological phenomena. So love is just a chemical imbalance. Ah. Uh, Schelling would find this atrocious. Um, <laughs> right. But at the same time, it misses something from the picture. So it misses, you know, in, in Schelling's, I don't want to, I don't want to use too much jargon to um, kind of be overbearing to your audience, but Schelling said something very early in his, in his 1797 book ideas he says nature is visible spirit so there's the realism and spirit is invisible nature there's the idealism and the the two together kind of join uh, what is a living person so a living person needs both its interior structure its interiority its its understanding its self-consciousness um and it also needs its realism. It needs its body. It needs this this thing that's the world. So the two of them kind of come together and form this kind of complex synthesis for him. Well, I, I find that appealing personally, and it certainly <laughs> um, comports with a lot of uh, what the spiritual traditions out there uh, would hold to be true. Um, but let's let's drill down a little bit on on idealism. Sure. Um, why is it that so many German thinkers seem to be so captivated by it, and, and seemingly at the same time, was it? Did it become popular? Was it a fad? Um, and so that's sort of part one. And two is why would a traditional, like a classical monotheist, maybe not like idealism? And the reason I ask that is because there are certain. I'm thinking of a Catholic philosopher. Um, in particular, who like who who really rejects it and doesn't like it, but I don't exactly understand why. So, so to so the German part of the question, and and then the traditionalist religiosity question, both framed around idealism. So this is a wonderful question. I hope you don't mind me being a little historical here. I don't. So in the medieval age, what what we saw was um, a formation of two. F- two kinds of truths. There was biblical truths, so the, the truths that's found in the Torah and the New Testament, and then there was the truths of Plato and Aristotle. 
And during this time, those were the only forms of knowledge that we could we could grasp upon. So if you look in the Jewish tradition, Maimonides does the same thing, Philo of Alexandria. If you look in the Islamic tradition, Avicenna and Aver- Averroes do the do this sort of similar thing, but with Aristotle. Um, and in the Christian tradition, um, what you get is a series of thinkers, Latin thinkers, working with these two forms of truth, you know, the Platonic, let's say Platonic, if we're working with Augustine um, and the biblical, the New Testament. And the thing is, is that they came up with different understandings. So for this tradition, you know, to have a thinker like Augustine and Aquinas coming up with didn't with new truths was problematic. And so when we reach the, the modern world, so I'm talking about Descartes here, he wanted to find a method that could solve the problem, that could that could find all the truths. And he wanted to, to um, map that onto mathematics. And so this is really the, the start of where idealism forms, this, mm-hmm. this, this Cartesian movement of the, the cogito ergo sum, or the I think therefore I am, and, and this whole kind of enlightenment philosophy of, you know, now we're going to try to find a new method. We're going to move away from the kind of ancient past and move forward to um, uh, a kind of a solid ground, an Archimedean point. But what happens is, is two formations, two schools form rationalism, you know, Descartes, Spinoza, um, and Leibniz, and then empiricist form, so the physicalists, the materialists, uh, Locke, Berkeley, and Hume. Now, out of this, out of this kind of, um, out of this odd um, uh, parallelism between the two of them, Kant emerges, but Kant emerges because Hume uh, challenges him. First, first and foremost, Hume says something like, um, human beings uh, cannot understand causality because we anticipate things. So I'll give you an example. The fact that the sun's going to, if I asked you a question, Adam, will the sun rise tomorrow? Very likely. You, Very likely. But how do you know that? Right. And he would basically say, well, we don't know that based on cause and effect. We know that by anticipating it. <clears throat> um, and and then Kant also woke up from his dogmatic slumber with this idea that Hume, according to Hume, there is no such thing as the self. We're just a bundle of sense data. And Kant is, is shooken by this. He's, he's shaken to his core in this very moment. What do you mean there's no self? What does that even mean? Mm-hmm. And so he asked him this question. So if we are this bundle of, of <clears throat> sense data, as you say, what's doing all the bundling? What's doing all the, what's what's synthesizing all of our experience? And this is what moves German idealism forward. It's this one movement. It's this this moment that wakes up Kant, that makes him realize, okay, what can reason give us? How can it? How can pure reason help us understand the world? and the experience of ourselves. And so that's really the, I'm sorry I took you on this long journey. That was great. And that's his critique of pure reason. Right? Exactly, that was, yes. yes. That's the critique of pure reason where he he creates a new idealism called transcendental idealism. And it's called transcendental because for Kant, he, he doesn't think that we can get into the very, we can't understand the whole. So what does that mean, the whole? Well. Say you decided to come and visit um, me in Toronto, and you wanted to come see York University or the University of Toronto, and you said, Chris, it's great to see you. I'd love to see U of T. So I take you to see the libraries. I take you to see here and there. But you're like, no, 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 Chris, I want to see all of U of T. And the problem here is that we as human beings can only take in specific parts of the whole. Mm-hmm. And Kant's whole point is, is that in this kind of very fragmented form of knowledge, we can never really get at the things themselves. What we can basically get are um, brief packets of, of the conditions of all possible experience. And so mm-hmm. Kant thinks that the world conforms to how our mind understands everything. So the faculties. So he'll give an example that some of the some of the faculties are quality quantity, relation, and modality. Now, I'm not trying to overbear us with, with with concepts, but this is important. So think about the room that you're in right now. 
So the first category of that under, of the faculties is quantity. How many objects are in that room that are filled up with space that your mind kind of absorbs, it takes in um, uh, qualities, the, the colors and textures and, and sounds that you're hearing around you. And the third relation is how you related to the chair you're sitting in or the, the table that you're at. And modality is how you think about that. So all of that, di all of that diverse and, you know, um, knowledge is being, you know, siphoned into your mind and kind of synthesized really nicely. And so this is what makes it transcendental, that there is this kind of barrier, but not really in a sense. It's there. The world is there. But we can't really um, we can't really get our hands on it. We can't fully get at it, is what Kant is essentially <clears throat> saying. So we we have int intuitions about the world, and those intuitions follow with concepts, and those concepts have content. So um, now this leads us to the second part of the question. It just stop me if I'm if I'm. In, I just wanted in, to make a comment, which is that it would sure. Uh, it's so self-evident to me what you're saying like I, I don't see how anyone could possibly challenge the idea that the nature is fragmented and that all we can possibly perceive is is a piece of it at a time and and, and quantum physics certainly seems to suggest that um you know who who is it that has such a grasp of reality that they they can take in the totality of it i don't think anyone would suggest that so it would be surprising to me that anyone would find fault with that idea well they do so the um, Kant is actually silenced by the, the Prussian king because of three things. So this, this gets back to your question about your Catholic uh, friend mm -hmm. or Catholic philosopher that was discussing. Um, I find a majority of Catholic philosophers are somehow, are, you know, modern Catholic philosophers are somewhere in between Thomism, so Thomas Aquinas, and mm -hmm. they'll think through someone like Heidegger or or uh, some kind of phenomenologist. The problem here is that for Kant, concepts like God, the immortality of the soul, and freedom are, we have concepts of them, but those concepts mm -hmm. are kind of empty. Now, I don't mean empty in the sense they don't mean anything. They mean so much to us, but we have no empirical data of them. Like if I, when I, when I teach this to my students, I often say, how many of you have experienced God? And I don't mean feeling. I mean, experienced empirically, mm -hmm. a majority of them will go, um, and then I say, mm -hmm. what Kant is saying is, it's not that there is no God, is that we don't have empirical datum of God, and yet we have this kind of concept with no, with no content. And so what, what he says, essentially, is we have to kind of bracket that concept and put it to a side. It means something to us, but we have no, we have no grounds for it. So it becomes a transcendental illusion, mm -hmm. but he holds on to it because it's un reason is unable to grasp the conception of God. He's in the supersensible. And the same thing ha applies with, um, with the immortal soul. But let me give you an a, a even better example. For freedom, he'll say the same thing. Freedom is too abstract, it's too theoretical, um, and it's, we have a concept of it but its content lacks, it, it lacks mm -hmm. in the real world. And so for Kant, freedom needs to be uh, actualized, participated. So I, I um, experience my freedom by recognizing you as the other, as recognizing my duty to you to have this conversation with you, recognizing you as an end in yourself. So this is how Kant breaks down um, these three kind of illusions that are a part of his pro his program. So God is is worked out through the antinomies and the first critique, the immortality of the soul and the practical element are done through his second critique, and freedom and judgment and all of these other elements are done through the third critique and his critique of judgment. Sorry if I went a little too far there. <clears throat> You're breaking open so many critical questions you know and i and, and this is what i love about philosophy is is you know <laughs> i just dives right into the heart you know of of what matters um and i and i wish there was more of a general appreciation for it you know i think it's it's taken a backseat to the scientific method as like as you know the only uh true way of investigating uh reality but it's my subjective feeling that that 
science always terminates in philosophy, you know, once you start analyzing what the data means, you know, which is, it seems like it's a different realm. But be that all as it may, you know, a concept like freedom, you know, and, and whether or not you can even experience it, when we have people who are debating day in and day out whether you are free at all or whether it's uh, simply illusory, I don't, how would you even know that you were free? Um, it, it, when you have scientific principles in physics saying it's impossible for you to, to actually be free, you may believe that you do, but that's not real. Um, on the one hand, and and if you want to have to take that to a much greater uh, abstraction, there, like you said, that there's God. Can you experience God? Well, I I might argue, of course, we're experiencing it at, at all times and at all moments. You know, like the, you're breathing, aren't you? You know, that's an experience of God. You you have a sense of love. That's an experience of God. You ate this morning and you were satisfied by it. That's God a godly thing. So. It, and other people would say, "What are you? What are you talking about? That's pure. All of that's purely physical." Um, and so it seems like the debate goes on, and that's that dichotomy that we, we we recognized at the very beginning: the body versus the soul, is is still raging. Um, but it, if I am understanding what you're saying in terms of the the Catholic appreciation or not or lack of appreciation of idealism, is it fair to say that it's simply not based in scripture, um, and and therefore and the fact that it's devoid of that content that you're talking about? is objectionable in the mind of the Catholic thinker. Is that basically it? Yes. Um, it's funny because uh, I was actually, so Schelling was later on in his life, um, was influenced by a Catholic philosopher named Franz von Bader, who's a theosopher actually. Um, and he inspired him in this tradition of Catholicism. So he started making him read people like Nicholas of Cusa and, and Meister Eckhart. Um, which are influences to Schelling, but he has so much other influence as well. But yes, yeah, so when I when I find um, there are brilliant Catholic thinkers, and there are thinkers that are that are kind of in stuck to the tradition that they and they won't really kind of go out of that tradition. So they're very Thomist, or um, I'm thinking of you know there's there's uh, Jean Luc Mérian, who's a Catholic philosopher that's that's brilliant. Um, that works through the tradition of phenomenology, brings up Levinas, brings up Heidegger, brings up other people like Husserl. Um, so we, there are different, there are different um, elements of it. But I would say, you know, especially when it comes to uh, a think a theologian or a thinker that's in a tradition, they're always going to stay very close to that tradition, mm -hmm. uh, and they tend not to branch away from it. Which okay, because. Do you see anything incompatible with idealism and 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 traditional religion? Because as I look into it, and I'm coming from a mono, you know, classical monotheistic perspective, I'm not bothered by it at all so far. Um, I, in fact, it seems to be describing an an important aspect of reality, truthfully. It, does it have to be incompatible? I don't think it has to. I don't see. I don't think it has to be incompatible. However, um, like I consider myself an idealist. Um, for me, I think a lot of it comes down to the institution. Mm -hmm. So uh, Schelling, for example, was a, a great kind of revolutionary uh, inspirer of, of the liberal um, education. Or, you know, I don't mean liberal, I don't understand liberal, but I mean like the, the ability Open. to study who we want to study Mm -hmm. um, and read who we want to read. And at the time, there was so much um, censorship and so much closure on, uh, on, on what you could read. And there was, you know, theologians reading Kant, you know, theologically, and there was so much dogma. So at the early, the early um, phases of their careers, even even Fichte, Fichte was, um, had to resign his position from Jena because he didn't have a fundamental concept of God. Um, mm -hmm. And so they accused him of atheism. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think it's incompatible, but I think when it comes to belief, you'd have mm -hmm. to separate belief from the institution. So like the Catholic church or, or some kind of elaborated church or, or synagogue or, or a mosque. Mm -hmm. Okay, fine. So, that was a lot on idealism, and that was very good. Um, and you answered a lot of my questions. Um, 
but like, so let, talk, me, uh, yeah, go like ahead. let me say i am not opposed to um any any kind of religious ideas so i'm one of those people that you know i would watch the debates between the the so-called four horsemen of the apocalypse the the four atheists you know hitchens harris and them and and i always found them uh, unacceptable when they came to philosophical debate because you know they would debate a rabbi or they debate a priest and they would take one paragraph out of context and just you know well this proposition is false based on this and that's not how you understand an argument inside and out sorry i didn't mean to no i i've had that experience as well so i know i know very well what you're talking about and uh and that's correct <laughs> and it's still and it's still going on on twitter for instance, uh, all over the place, which is not the best forum actually for a philosophical discussion, um, but it is interesting how people try to encapsulate into these in tiny spaces all these very big ideas. Um, but okay, let let let's talk about nature, um, which I know that Schelling was very into. You quoted him before. You said uh, nature is visible spirit, and spirit is invisible nature. Okay, so what I wanted to ask you about that is given that nature itself is both beautiful you know which many people appreciate and love and and also is rather brutal um there are, are countless examples and i was going to bring a, a specific one about this this some insect which like devours these other insects in these horrible ways you know um and like lives inside of it and then and, and controls it it's like i think they're called zombie ants um anyway the you know we, we tend to focus on what's beautiful and pleasurable about nature and we tend to ignore what's like really harsh and um and uh, and brutal i think that's the right word um so what what would that aspect of nature teach us about spirit in Schelling's way of thinking about things very good question so just to, to elaborate on what you were saying um Schelling was a, a young boy coming to the Tübingen Seminary, um, you know, he was 15, um, and he started hanging around people like Holderlin, Frederick Holderlin, um, uh, Hegel, Schiller, Novalis, Schleiermacher, um, the Schlegel brothers, uh, Dorothy Veidt, Caroline Schlegel, um, all of these great romantic thinkers that were opposed to how we see the world how it's mechanical, how it's atomized according to the Cartesian um, enlightenment understanding of the world. And even Kant was fighting against this, to a, to a certain point, was fighting against the kind of Newtonian element of the, of the cosmos. But when Schelling starts, you know, talking and discussing with Goethe and all of these wonderful thinkers, he realizes that, no, nature can't be this dead, productivity it can't just be this dead product it's not a substance we understand nature relationally speaking so horizontally as opposed to vertically um and how can nature be spirit a great question so what he means essentially is that nature like human beings have this interiority have this interior element to them um you want to call that soul you want to call that spirit but for him, spirit really means the potence or the potency um, that's, that lies dormant in a leaf, let's say. So we don't see the element of photosynthesis within a mm -hmm. plant. We don't see, um, you know, trees sending messages um, in the dirt through, through you know, um, uh, through fungal, like a fungal network. Mycelium. So we don't see this element. And that's, yes, yes, thank you, thank you. <laughs> so we don't see this um this kind of interior element of nature. And when we tend to philosophize about nature, we tend to compartmentalize it. We tend to cut it up. We tend to talk about the materiality of it. And Schelling wanted to talk about this great interior element that lies dormant within nature, just like within humanity. And is that a material thing? Like a photosynthesis is a material process or, or is it a spiritual thing? So he'll call it, um, of course so at the time he called it his speculative physics which is interesting it's a speculative philosophy but at the same time it's a dynamic atomism so yes it is material it's a material process let's just talk about the actual process here and essentially he is a so he's not a vitalist a lot of people kind of paint him as a vitalist he's not a vitalist he's an animist he's a dynamist so he's looking for the dynamic interaction 
between the material and the spiritual. So you're mm-hmm. right, photosynthesis is 100% is a material process. Um, and a lot of this is, a lot of these, um, a lot of these processes are material. And it's not about, he's not trying to draw, oh, look, there's a kind of spiritual element to nature. What he's trying to say is that nature really has reason. Nature really has its own ground. It has its own kind of uh, spirit in the sense of its own kind of power, its potency, um, is what he's trying to get across. I don't know if I'm being clear. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, why, why is he interested in that? What, what, what difference does it make? It, that's a good question. It means that nature isn't just some regenerated, degenerated process, that nature is alive. Nature is, you know, um, he, okay, so he calls nature in the, his first treatises on nature, the unconditioned, in German, the un, unbedingt, right, the unthinged. It's this, it's this absolute product of product, sorry, process of productivity. And that in this absolute process of productivity, what happens is, is sometimes, you know, he'll give us a great example of a river. When a riverbed is going down, it, 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 hits, it hits edges and, and turns and twists, and it's inhibited. And this action of inhibited um, stops this absolute flow of productivity. And what we get are products out of that. What he wants to show is that within this moment of absolute productivity, we have of the infinite written in the finite. So everything, Mm -hmm. including nature, has this infinite spark of productivity in its own individual product, in its own kind of individual productive self. So Mm -hmm. it's, it's finite, it's infinite in the finite form, essentially. So he's trying to deal with that debate of between the infinite, the finite, the actual, and the potential is what he's trying to essentially get to, that nature has its own kind of fundamental reason. Um, nature has its own kind of ground. It has its own interiority. But at the same time, it's a part of this wonderful productive structure that is life. And that's his kind of inner dynamism in a sense. So, so is that dissimilar me, than I'm saying, sorry? is that just, is that dissimilar from saying God is in the natural world? The, if you're saying the infinite is within the finite, I mean, is, is it, are those just different words for, for that, for that that basic concept? So, this is okay. So, I will say yes and no. So, this <laughs> in, it's funny because in these texts, you know, God is kind of missing. He's the kind of missing element. I totally this... noticed. I noticed that, and I was reading some last night, and they talk around and around and around it, and they keep talking about it without ever saying it. It's it's exactly. actually quite wild. So uh, it's funny because, you know, um, by 1800, you know, the word God will come in, in into the picture, but it's slightly, slightly missing. I don't want to add God to the, sorry, my, I don't want That's to okay. add God in this, this, this moment, this element moment, because he doesn't use the term, but the unconditioned is really meant to be this kind of undifferentiated absolute product. It's this kind of, you know, later on, Schelling kind of has a Christian pantheism that's sort of uh, aligned with, with Spinoza and his Spinoza's kind of uh, monism. Yeah. So he animates it later on. He realizes that what he's trying to do is when he creates this nature philosophy, nature philosophy, he realizes that this is one element of the whole. The other element is the transcendental idealism, and he writes a transcendental idealism. So his first books are this, you know, two si- two halves of one whole. Mm-hmm. And so we get this, he was worried that nature had been written so problematically in the tradition. Kant calls nature, you know, a thing in itself. Um, but mm-hmm. at the same time, Kant will give nature teleology that we don't really know nature in and of itself however we can self-reflectively think that it's somehow organized um this is what inspires all the romantics uh fichte calls nature the not i the not self uh, and so there's this kind of you leave nature kind of is thrown to the wayside and and it takes people the kind of anti-systematic thinking of of people like novalis and schlegel who are anti-systematic um, they don't like system um, to kind of bring nature to the 
to the fore again. And what Schelling is trying to wrestling with, he's wrestling really, mm-hmm. is this tradition of Kant's third critique of uh, Goethe's um, metamorphosis. And so he's kind of bringing these two together for this treatise, for his treatises, sorry. Um, and he and he'll work with it until about 1803, and then he finally puts it down and starts working with his identity philosophy. But you're right. Um, could this like unconditioned be God in a sense? Later it will be. Later mm-hmm. this whole process, this whole kind of mythical tension of God brought in um, by his readings of Jakob Burma and the Kabbalah and 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 mystical theological writers like Erdinger. And he's uh-huh. also reading the theologian Erdinger, who is a who is really absorbed in in Jewish mysticism and Kabbalah. And there was always this kind of all processes have this moment of contraction and expansion. Yeah. And so he says the same thing in in um, in nature. So nature has its own. So you were talking about what about these these ants that that these zombie <laughs> ants that are killing or whatever. And so. Yeah these processes so this the process of absolute productivity still has this moment of inhibition and in contraction and expansion so he gets mm-hmm. that from erdinger and erdinger's effect erdinger's kind of dynamism reading through the, the the tradition of kabbalah so this is this is part of his philosophy he realizes that it's not just one gigantic monism it's not just one kind of dynamic harmony mm-hmm. um but there, there has to be there has to be strife there has to be struggling and he sees all all phenomena in nature as actants he calls them dynamic monads in a sense they're actants they're actors so when you see a tree being blown by wind there's two actors there the wind and the tree itself i'm sorry if i'm going off on tangents here no i love it i and it these are things obviously you know that um i have spent not nearly as much time as you have, <laughs> but thinking about, but maybe in different ways, and um, and and sort of uncovering them within the world of philosophy is really exciting. Um, and and what I'm finding is that like things that I'm aware of are expressed in all these different forums, and it's sort of uh, rewarding to to come across them, you know, and 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 to sort of hash them out, and to try to like drill down into the essence of it. And and in this particular instance, I found it interesting that they don't they're not so explicit um with with the drilling down um however I, I at the same time i do appreciate what they're doing and and i see the need for it and i and i appreciate the struggle uh i think that's very honest and i think that's very real um but so for the in the interest of time let let me ask and i could talk about nature for a long time but i think that one is really interesting <laughs> but um let's talk about history uh, from Schelling's perspective. So I have another quote, which is, um, history as a whole is a progressive, gradually self-disclosing revelation of the absolute. Now, to me, that's a very grand statement and an, actually an exciting one at that. My question for you is, um, why does he think this? And and what are some examples that he might bring to bear on, on that concept oh this is like this is my favorite element of shelling so uh, i'm always asked to speak about nature which is so funny and that's that's one element of 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 his work but the work that you're talking about now is my favorite um so shelling um kind of goes through a depression um his wife passes uh, his wife caroline um and at the time he's you know, kind of smothered in, in Catholic Bavaria, and he's 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 hanging around um, theosophers that kind of bring back his kind of boyhood thinkers, like you know um, Johann Elbrecht Bengel, this uh, another thinker that was influenced by Jakob Burma. Uh, he starts reading this 16th century, no, 17th, I'd say. He's a he's relatively close to Descartes as well, thinker that. Jakob Burma was this brilliant theosopher that was um, rethinking Lutheranism, but was um, friends with so many Jewish uh, Jewish thinkers at the time and and centers, and brought in alchemy and and um, Kabbalah and all of these wonderful elements in to rethink um, the process of creation and revelation. 
um, and that God actually, uh, and he gets a lot of this from the Torah, um, a lot of this is is structure and pain and struggle that God is going through. Hmm. So Schelling takes this, you know, very kind of uh, dynamic reading of from Burma, and he starts rethinking what is history, um, what is revelation, and what is our relationship to the absolute. And this becomes his his major project uh, from let's say 1809 onward. And it's to rethink that. And I'll, I would say that history, so history is is spirit in a sense, not in the Hegelian sense. We can go over that. Freedom and personality, they're all, all part of this. But just as we struggle in our life, God also struggles. So in the Freedom Essay, um, Schelling gives us this beautiful you know, um, reading of the creation of the world in a kind of neoplatonic, but also kind of Jewish mystic kind of element. There's this element that, you know, God is kind of, there's the zimzum, the contraction inward, pulling out this pomp, creating the the uh, the receptacle. And there's this kind of division of God's essence, the Ein Sof. Yeah. And well. These two principles is beautiful. He, really, really elegant, elegantly written. Where does he write this? Uh, in the Freedom Essay, actually. Um, okay, now I have to read it. <laughs> you do have to read it. And and um, someone like Rosenzweig, who is another wonderful thinker, reads um, Schelling's Ages of the World, which I'm going to get to in a second, and writes it, rewrites the end of it. And he says, look, you know, the way that Schelling writes this is not a Jewish um, uh, creation. It's not a Christian creation. It's creation. It's a, a jointure of the two. And this is why I love him so much. And he really brings together the religious um, monotheism of the traditions. He's not one of those thinkers in Germany that is just Christian Christianity this, Christianity that. No, there is a reason to this process. And so for him, he's thinking through this this element of Kabbalah and alchemy and Neoplatonism and bringing them in so nicely. And so what is, what is um, history here? History is this moment where we as human beings can cognize this knowledge of of the logos so this is going to sound very weird um but essentially when this creation happens when god creates the cosmos um he creates in this ground this kind of dark ground um that dark ground is just empty but it's co-eternal with god Mm -hmm. and so you know, this is the kind of historical element. This is the first, the first peoples without monotheism. You could, you could think in a sense. Um, when the logos enters the ground, you can think of that like, biblically speaking, you can think of that either in terms of Adam and Eve, or you can think of that as Moses um, getting the laws, the commandments from from God. And so for him, Revelation is a dual point. It's the point that comes from the Jewish people, which is the law, the ground. Um, and then, of course, the incarnation of that law um, in personality, which would be Christ. So he gets very religious at the end of his of his era. But history is so important when it comes to self consciousness. It's he's not saying that we weren't conscious before before monotheism. What he's essentially saying is that revelation is the history of God being brought to us, the story, the mythos mm-hmm. of it, um, which is very compelling for me because. Um, uh, I mean, I, I went through a period where I had to reread all of these great religious texts again um, and re- rereading them through this kind of animated voice, uh, Schelling's voice and his kind of poetic voice as well. It's like enrapturing. You're, you're so drawn to the image. Um, and, and he sees, you know, all of, all of these stories as being a part of how our consciousness is constructed, not in a union sense, but in a sense of how we understand personality, how we understand, you know, you know, good and evil, how we understand what a decision is, what a choice is. Mm-hmm. Um, and even that, even that term decision, you know, God is not the God of the dead, but God of the living. He says that it was God's conscious decision. And there you go, remove the DE, you have a decision, a split. There's the splitting of his essence. Um, hmm. You have this, 
this deciding to create, but always creating. So the Godhead or God himself, the Father, is always eternally creating, um, always going through this struggle. And so Schelling is, you know, not trying to give us some kind of harmonious theodicy here. He's rethinking the theodicy via history and revelation. So for him, revelation, of course, has to do with the factum or the fact of of God's existence or God's knowledge or our knowledge along with this great this kind of, kind of great story. I don't want to call it story. I know it's a religion. They're both religions here um, being applied, but they, it's kind of um, uh, it's kind of like the knowledge kind of is 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 built. It indwells us. There's kind of an indwelling of it. You know, we we go along with these kind of morals, these kind of stories, these this whole you know from the prophets onward. Mm-hmm. So he he finds that you know we need to radically rethink um, religion, uh, and this happens you know between 1806 uh, sorry 1804 to his his last writings in the 1850s, where he's rethinking these traditions, and not just Christianity, Judaism as well, um, and other and other forms. You know he he's interested in the the process of mythology, so he's interested in the Egyptians, the Indians. Uh, Chinese as well, and he's one of the first to be reading people like, um, uh, oh my gosh, why can't I think of that person's name? He's reading things like the Bhagavad Gita. He's mm-hmm. reading many mythologies, but mythology represents necessity. It doesn't represent the concept of freedom and personality. And there's this this element that history mar- kind of maps on to revelation that really gives us two concepts, freedom and personality. We, by freedom, he means radical freedom. So not just, you know, not just the, you know, can I pick up this pen or not? For Schelling, freedom is this kind of creation of your personality. It happens in, in eternity. So what makes you Adam and what makes me Chris? Like he'll, he'll, he gives this line about Judas, um, selling Jesus for 30 um, pieces of silver. And he says, look, the act is not sin, that act. So when we sin, it's not the act of sin is not a sin. What is a sin is our is our kind of our character. The fact that we we have chose this element of ourselves. We we took this dark ground and we subordinated inside of ourselves over a universal principle, which is according to the universal principle is Kant's principle of seeing people as ends in themselves. Sorry, I was all over the place there. I apologize. No, it was awesome. <laughs> and um, and we've you know I've, we've gone over time, but that's because I'm enjoying myself. Um, <laughs> and so I want to just take the opportunity to ask you one final question for sure. for now. We can go as long as you'd like. I I'm well, it's why I. I I have a uh, we have a goal, you know, for how long we these are supposed to be. But uh, I don't mind going. Uh, we are going a little over by asking this one, but it's just fine. Um, the last quote uh, has to do with approaching God, I would say, and I thought it, it's so um, so interesting and so familiar. Well, he says the Godhead is not divine nature or substance, but the devouring ferocity of purity that a person is able to approach only with an equal purity. Since all being goes up as in if, as if in flames, it is necessarily unapproachable to anyone still embroiled in being. Now that, it, th- there's there's so much wrapped up into that, you know, uh, the, the entire notion of prophecies, you know, seers and mystics and, you know, the, the notion of approaching the infinite on its terms and not ours, you know, and, and then therefore having to take certain steps to prepare yourself, you know, for, for such an encounter. So for people out there who, who, who say like, hey, you know, if God is so pervasive and so powerful and, you know, so where is it, you know? Um, how come I have no experience of it? As you said, like, does nature show you? Does history show you? Um, can you have an actual palpable experience of the, of the divine? Um, I love the fact that he comes along and says, no, you know, you know what? You have to, you have to change if you want that understanding and if you want that experience. From, from your vantage point, you know, 
our consciousness is too narrow, our understanding is too limited, and therefore you have to do what you have to do to be able to approach this process. You know, so so my question is, what is that? What what would he expect us to do uh, tangibly in order to be able to um, to approach the devouring ferocity of purity, as he calls it? <laughs> Are you getting that quote from the Ages of the World? You know, I w- I should have written it down, and I, I I wrote down some of the other quotes where they came from, but I didn't for this one, so I'm not sure. That's okay. It sounds like the Ages of the World. Um, and it sounds like he's paraphrasing Jakob Burma's, you know, God is the devouring flame or the devouring fire. Um, he wants to show, he wants to show that written in all life, all life, um, is a kind of dual process, but the dual leads to the third, or the trio, that at first there's darkness and then there's light. And he'll always bring up these two principles, that there's darkness and light. And what he's trying to say is that if you're looking for this in a sunrise, if you're looking for this in, um, if you're looking for this in, you know, looking over the, um, I can't think of it right now. <laughs> it's in Arizona, you know, the Grand, Grand Canyon. Canyon. Sorry. Yeah, the Grand Canyon. <laughs> if you're trying to look for it in that kind of Freudian oceanic, you're not going to find it. You're going to find it in darkness. You're going to find mm. it in light. You're going to find it in this dual process because just like we struggle in daily life, so does the eternal, so does God the Father, according to Schelling, that, you know, um, he says at the end of the Freedom Essay, which to this day, when I when I go to conferences and we talk about this essay, people call it deliciously confused or people are just blown away. They're, they're what? At the end of the Freedom Essay, he says, what's higher than spirit? So what's higher than spirit? Love. And spirit is accordingly history. What do you mean by love? What is this element of love that you're talking about? Well, love is the attractive principle. It's the principle that draws two people together. It's the principle that, um, <laughs> that you know, you don't need the other, but want to be with the other. So it's this kind of so out of the out of the kind of um, the dynamic uh, potencies of you know contraction and expansion. Now we get attraction. We get this attracting force that's supposed to be this kind of cleansing force, this cleaning force, sorry, um, that is supposed to help us understand and realize, you know, the Godhead here. You know, when when I was once speaking with a, another Shilingin about this, um, and I was telling them, and they looked at me shocked when I said this, but when you when you open up the Torah and you're reading, you know, Genesis, and you see God hovering over the void, I always tell people that's not God. God's not there. God's in et- God's in eternity. He's not in time. Well, it says what? it's the spirit of God that is hovering. Exactly. So yeah. the spirit. So we have the spirit. We have this kind of Godhead here hovering over the void, like a demiurge in Neoplatonic terms. You know, creating this world, creating this whole thing, creating this kind of creating the cosmos, bringing everything together. Um, and so. There, there's a whole structure here. There's a there's a creation element. There's a there's a um, a transcending transcendent and imminent element to mm-hmm. this whole kind of uh, understanding. But it's also a, um, what I love about it is that it's it's a it's not too abstract. You know, you can think of you can think of yourself choosing things, being in love with with people. You know, having relationships, etc. And the same thing is happening to the the um, the eternal father, you know, the father has, has created this. Um, I'm kind of going on a tangent here and I apologize. It's okay. That's okay. The the, the point is, is, is it's to make, it's to make, um, it's to make us realize that there, that the God that we're talking about, um, is a living God. It's not a dead God. It's not an abstract concept. It's not a super sensible in the Kantian terms. We're talking about real processes. So when people want to, look for these these signs in the world Schelling would be perfectly fine with that as long as you're not just looking at it and like a rainbow or something but you're looking at you know in in both both processes he'll say you know all birth is formed in all birth is is formed in darkness you know it must mm-hmm. first be 
you know, be formed in the darkness and then kind of gravitating towards the light. So, and the light and the darkness, you know, once you're in the light, it's not just you're in the light, you know, the sun comes up and then it comes back down, you're back in the dark. So it's a process. It's a dynamic process. There's, you're always in this struggle and you never really get away from it. And at the end of that wonderful, (laughs) the end of the text of, um, of the ages of the world, we see this. The beauty of the ages of the world is the narrator takes us through God's struggle. So the first element of the book is God's struggle. So God's understanding of what the zimzum is, this contraction and making the receptacle to be the God, you know, the Godhead Mm -hmm. kind of forming within that, hovering over the void. And then from that forming itself, and then creating the world, which is beautiful. It's a beautiful element. So you see, like, he gives us that which is uncognizable. And this is another element I should have brought up. Schelling has this wonderful concept at the end of his work called the unprethinkable. And the reason why it's unprethinkable is because being comes before thought. Mm -hmm. So the beginning of the world, the creation of the cosmos, was something that was unthought. Because yes. it was being, being, it was being, being created. Wow, I sound like uh, Heidegger here. Being and being and being and being. So it's something that's uncognizable, and so he calls it uh, this unprethinkable because it's uncognizable, but it's there. And the fact of the matter that it's there is that there's a world around us. There's a world in front of us. I'm sorry, Adam. I went all over the place. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> That was very good. And you know what? Um, I think your students are very lucky to have you as a teacher, and, and I wish I was in your class. But um, thank you, Dr. Chris, for for being here today, taking the time to speak with me. I want to uh, encourage people to follow you on, on Twitter and, um, and wherever else you would like them to. Um, and also to check out beyondbelief.blog where we upload all of our videos and, and uh, podcasts and, and written content. Um, and we have a lot more where this came from. And um, thank you again for being here. Encourage everybody to be part of all that we have coming up. And thank I you thank so you much. For, I thank you for, for having me here as well. And I'll share everything. I'll share all of your content on um, on Twitter because I think that's great. And 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 other and other avenues of uh, social media. Thank you. I appreciate it. And uh, it was great to meet you. Great meeting you as well, too. All right. Bye. Take care. Bye.